Over. You know, then some chords. Yes, Syrian came down like a wolf from the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming like silver and gold. <laughs> and the sheen of his stars were like stars in the sun. Whatever it is. That's going to go. That's going to be a continuing notes without a single breaking. <laughs> and I almost lost it there, but <laughs> easy. <laughs> From the British pop revolution of the 1960s emerged an entirely new breed of musician, a post-Beatles, post-psychedelic generation that saw a future of limitless possibilities. It was time for pop music to move beyond the three-minute love song and chart success. With little or no concern for fame, fortune or the audience, they plundered every musical form on an adventure into uncharted territory in search of the lost chord. This is the story of that generation of new bands. Yes, King Crimson, Genesis, ELP, Jethro Tull, and many more. From the land that time forgot. The glory days of Prog Britannia. In 1967, pop music, like the world it inhabited, was about to explode. In London, the British beat boom fused with American pop in a blaze of invention that would ransack jazz, folk and anything else it could find in the many basement clubs of the city. I do think there are periods which are golden ages, and you know, the stars are aligned and whatever is happening that produces a lot of creativity. Where I was at college, it was like a snapshot of music at the time. The angry bot people liked the Beatles. The side I was on was blues upstairs and in the cellar Bob Dylan and then you had the, the modern jazz guys and the classical guys. Otis Redding and Sam and Dave and Booker T and the Angies came over and, and you suddenly realized that you know it's game up. <laughs> you can't pretend to be them anymore when they're actually here. There was some white music, even black musicians were listening to. For example, uh, Jimi Hendrix was listening very hard to Bob Dylan, you know. There was stuff going on. Then there was, you know, huge social changes and huge chemical changes going on. Uh, there was something definitely in the water. Uh, I mean, timing's everything. I mean, the smartest thing I did was get born in 1949. Brilliant, brilliant. Because, uh, at 18, you're in 1968. You know, Europe's aflame, the Paris riots, you know. Perfect. I was in the States in 68, and there were three major assassinations while we were there. A few Kennedys, and an Andy Warhol or two, and, you know, it was all, all happening. It was all happening, but much of the music only reached eager young British ears courtesy of outlaws. Offshore pirate radio stations broadcasting illegally to a nation still dominated by something called the BBC Light Programme. You know, it was unreachable. You felt like you were tuning into another planet, you know, contacting the aliens and coming to another world. You can only reach it you know, on little transistor radios um, late at night. Then, in May 1967, a song that fused Bach with Percy Sledge via Bob Dylan and Geoffrey Chaucer was heard leaving for the coast. A Whiter Shade of Pale by Prokel Harum. I wouldn't be exaggerating when I said that the world was waiting for that. You skip the light, Fandango. Turns cartwheels across the floor. The Beatles and the beat boom had been going for certainly three or four years. 
it was all get, it was getting a little bit tired. The crowd called out for more. I won't do something, but I didn't want it to be like anything else, because we've we've had we've had it all. This I've never heard this before, really. That's what you think to yourself. Therefore, I like this. <laughs> And so it was that later, only two weeks later, as the Miller told his tale, the Beatles released an album that was a concept, a world unto itself. A blueprint for progressive rock. A whiter shade of pale topped the British singles chart the very same week that Sgt Pepper announced the artistic triumph of the album. Bands were still making singles, you know, Cream, uh, Strange Fruit, Pink Floyd, Arnold Lane and See Emily Play, and uh, Procol Harum, Whiter Shade of Pale, all of these records, you know, were, they, they were amazing, creative, interesting singles. And they also were inc incredibly commercially successful. So I mean, the bands were getting, at that moment were getting the best of both worlds. It was Sergeant Pepper and the, the creative, you know, amazement of Sergeant Pepper that really convinced everybody that, that you, you can extend ideas onto an album, you can make concept albums. In fact, with the album, you can do almost exactly whatever you want. It was a strange mixture of um, it's almost music hall and totally other world music, you know. That was the wonderful thing about it, is it bridged a gap between, you know, the, the real world and this other world. And the other thing, it was all totally new. You know, I never heard anything like that before. It's more fun in the record if there's a few sounds that you don't really know what they are, and really they're just instruments, only something happens on here, you know. I couldn't tell you what, because we have a special man who sits here and goes like this and the guitar turns into a piano or something, you know. And then you may say, why don't you use a piano? Because the piano sounds like a guitar. If you look at the, the leap in terms of musical vocabulary and sophistication between the first Beatles album and, and Sgt. Pepper, which is like five years, kind of everything that could be done with that form has already been done in a way in those five years. Where else can you take it except to try and make it more and more sophisticated and more and more musically interesting? or just for, for rock music to, go, to kind of go on repeating itself and regurgitating itself. I like, if you like, like there's a lot of classical music I liked. I was always frightened of classical music, and I never wanted to listen to it because it was Beethoven and Tchaikovsky and some big words like that, and Schoenberg. I think a lot of people started to appreciate many other genres. Pop music is the classical music of now. Probably the Beatles have been listening to the same stuff, smoke the same cannabis, you know, now and again. A lot of people were smoking on the choir, and they were actually got furious when the hippies came on because suddenly there was a lot of notice being taken out, whereas they'd been quietly, with, with, you know, enjoying themselves for a long time. This was the era when, you know, if you wanted to try something, you, you could, you know, you knew a mate who had some hashish, or you knew a mate who had some. LSD, you know, but you had to be careful. If you were very cautious and, and uh, took very little of these things, you could meddle and let not lose your mind and end up in hospital. Cannabis was a stimulant, and it did enable you to hear a lot more in the music. I mean, it was there. You weren't imagining it. It was in there. But you concentrated more on listening to it. What came from that was the ability for people who would normally copy American music suddenly wanted to express themselves and so you had the strange thing at that time that almost every band had a, a unique sound. Nobody sounded quite like anyone else. I moved across to what was really a new mu movement in music, which was the psychedelia period. 
And that was Arthur Brown, the crazy world of Arthur Brown. I mean, we didn't know what it was, and we were in it. <laughs> um, it was pretty confrontational, for that time, shocking. Arthur's concept was uh, basically about the beginning of time, the beginning of life. I am the god of hellfire, and I bring you... The original for the maker was the death mask, which goes back right through English history and further than that. It was kind of deep, really. It was real, you know? <laughs> Sometimes we'd, uh, the bowl would be filled with petrol and the roadie would stand there throwing matches a good distance away until one landed in and then we'd go... Pfft.